Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's symposium. Building a robust biomedical innovation ecosystem. Learning from MIT and the Massachusetts Life Science Center, organized by Biomedical Translation Research Center, Biotrack of Academicica. Taiwan Research Based Biopharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, TRPMA, and Medigen Vaccine Biologics Corporation. As a kind of reminder, please put your mobile phone to silence or vibrate mode before starting. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Wu Hanzhong, Director of Biotrack, to give us an opening remark. Let's give our warm welcome to Dr. Wu. Which has acquired by Tuck 
飛行，破 one point 啊破誒 eight point eight billion US dollars， and the rupee is circulating， which had IPO 啊、uh, in 誒 twenty eighteen。Today, uh, we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Lodish to give us a keynote speech on how to build a robust biomedical innovation ecosystem. So without further ado, let's give our warmest welcome to Dr. Lodish. Uh, I really appreciate that very generous introduction. Uh, as you heard, I have been involved in biotechnology for quite a number of years, really since the beginning of biotechnology in the late 1970s. And I hope that my talk this morning will give you all some ideas of how to develop biotechnology in Taipei, particularly how to take research out of the many great biological and medical research labs in the country, not just start companies, but to build companies to the stage where they can actually produce human therapeutics or diagnostics. I'll give a brief history of biotechnology because it really sets the stage for how it was done in Boston. It was driven by faculty members, faculty entrepreneurs, not by the government. I'll talk about many aspects of building biotech companies that has led to the incredible ecosystem that we have in Boston, where we have not only several hundred startup biotechs, many of which have grown quite large, but 18 of the world's largest biopharmaceutical companies resident in Boston or Cambridge to collaborate with and buy or work with the startup companies. I'll talk about the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, uh, a state agency that has played a key role in building biotechnology. And I was privileged to lead their scientific advisory board, and then biotherapeutics for rare diseases. Um, as you see here, I have indeed been involved in starting and building biotech companies. Not all of my companies have been successful. This is a risky business. A lot of companies get started that never should have been. And a number of companies with very good ideas will ultimately fail because of unanticipated problems with clinical trials. Um, I will talk later about the Massachusetts Life Sciences uh, Center the state agency that dispersed one and a half US billion dollars to help build biotechnology in Massachusetts in a number of ways. And also I have been privileged to serve on the board of trustees of Boston Children's Hospital, the largest pediatric research hospital in the world, and have worked with them very closely to encourage entrepreneurs to take some of the research from the hospital into the clinic. A general reminder before we get into the details. What we do in our academic research labs is not develop drugs or therapies. What we do is what is called proof of concept research. Uh, using government support or patient group support, will develop what is called proof of concept. That is, if you inhibited a particular enzyme or overexpressed a particular gene, you could, in mice, cure a disease. But taking that proof of concept out of our laboratories into the clinic 
requires a company. And what we have to remember is the goal of a for-profit company is, of course, to generate an FDA-approved therapeutic. But it is also important that it will generate a financial return to the investors who put money into the company. And therein lies a complicated discussion of exactly how the company is formed, how it grows, and how it makes the decisions of what drugs to pursue. Because to get to the stage of an FDA in the state's approved therapeutic, it requires many years and millions of dollars. Clinical trials are expensive. Roughly speaking, a single patient in a clinical trial will cost somewhere between 40 and 50,000 US dollars. We can go later into the reasons for this, but when you talk about hundreds of patients through phase one, safety, phase two, a small group of people with the disease who will be trying your therapeutic, and then phase three, which can have hundreds of patients. This takes years and a lot of money. So it requires investors who put in not just a few million dollars to start the company, but put in the tens, if not hundreds of millions of US dollars that it's necessary to take it to the point where it becomes an FDA therapeutic. So whereas it's fairly easy to start a company, it is quite difficult to grow the company to the point where it has FDA approval of a therapeutic. So to put this in perspective, let me give you a history, a brief history of biotechnology. I was part of it, which began in the 1970s. Before that time, with the exception of insulin, the only drugs that we had were small organic molecules that were taken by mouth. The whole notion of protein therapeutics that patients would be injected with protein drugs was foreign to every one of the large biopharmaceutical companies. None of them were in the biotech revolution. It was the development of recombinant DNA in the 70s and early 80s that led to the notion that one could clone a gene and then express the recombinant protein, either in bacterial cells or more commonly in uh, bioreactors of animal cells. And this led to the first biotechnology companies, companies such as Biogen and Genzyme in Boston and Genentech and Amgen on the US West Coast. These were all started by faculty members faculty entrepreneurs. And of course, this led to the first products of the biotech industry, which were all recombinant proteins, insulin, growth hormone, interferon, erythropoietin, uh, stimulating red cell production. At one time, it was the largest selling pharmaceutical in the world. GCSF, I'll talk about glucocerebrosidase the Genzyme product. And what you realize from this slide is even today, the largest selling drugs by monetary value are protein therapeutics. They're outlined in red. Uh, Humira, the largest selling drug, uh, sells for more than 20 billion US dollars a year. 
together with two other drugs on this list. Uh, one a monoclonal antibody, one a receptor protein. All three target tumor necrosis factor alpha, which I dare to say is something few of you may have heard about. But those three drugs together sell for over 30 billion US dollars. That was in 2018. It continues. The largest selling drugs last year besides the two mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna are largely monoclonal antibodies. So that was the beginning of the biotech revolution in the 80s, monoclonal antibodies and um, recombinant proteins. And of course, with the human genome in 2002, we now had access to all 20,000 roughly human genes. And this led to the development of all types of novel therapies that go on today, RNA nucleotide therapies, several of which, as you see, are FDA approved. Diseases such as transthyroid amyloidosis and spinal muscular atrophy, let alone the mRNA vaccine. A number of gene therapies have been approved, and certainly cell therapies, particularly CAR T cells and variants for cancer immunotherapy. And further advances, particularly gene uh, uh, base editing and prime editing, uh, will lead to more drugs. We have now in Boston the world's largest agglomeration of biotech drugs. Let's see if I can do this. This is an aerial view of Cambridge. Here's the Charles River. For those of you who know MIT geography, this is Main Street, uh, north to south, leading to the bridge, the Longfellow Bridge. This is MIT. Across the street is the Whitehead Institute, where I work, the Broad Institute. And this is the center of a huge area, and it goes off in the distance, that has all of these biotech companies. I'll talk in a moment about how it started. One thing that helped is this federal law passed in 1980 called the Bayh-Do Law, which gave all rights to federal research in the United States, federally funded research, to the universities. And they could commercialize, they were encouraged to commercialize this research. It required that the revenue be shared with inventors and it generates increased research, new products, educational opportunities, and particularly economic development. And this led to technology licensing offices. But it also led to this key faculty provision, which I argue underlies all of the success of biotechnology in the United States. That is, as faculty members, we are given by right one day outside consulting privileges. In other words, as I jokingly say, MIT pays me for five days work, but I only need to work four. I work the fifth day, but I do it for institutions other than MIT. I can and do serve on boards of nonprofit agencies, such as Boston Children's Hospital. But I also am allowed, and of course do sit, on boards of directors of companies that I help start. And it's not just me 
All of my faculty colleagues do this. We are not allowed to actually run a company. I cannot be the CEO or chief scientific officer or chief financial officer or anything like that. But I can and do sit on the scientific advisory board. And for most of my companies, we will have weekly data meetings, some in person, some over Zoom, that allow me to keep up to date as to the research of the company, give advice. I also uh, participate in the hiring and evaluation of staff. And this is a long tradition of MIT. And I would argue if you don't have this privilege here, as I believe you do not, I would encourage you to start it. Because it really will jumpstart the involvement of faculty. And faculty need to be trained to be entrepreneurs. It is not natural. I, when I joined the MIT faculty in 1968, it never occurred to me to be an entrepreneur to start companies. But it was in the culture of the Institute. I could give you details. But we have a long history. When the eight of us put together Genzyme, one of the group had uh, George Whiteside had much previous experience in starting companies. And he mentored me. And I watched him, and I learned how to do it. And now I mentor many young people who come to me. They say, don't worry about it. You know, Harvey, you know, I think I have a company. Can you help me? And I say, sure, I'll help you. Uh, all I really want, you don't pay me. All I really want is 1% of the company. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. OK? And I, I don't invest in companies. I work for shares. Um, we offer many courses, uh, some listed here. Um, for the last seven years, I have taught a course uh, we can go into it in more detail later if we have time, called The Science and Business of Biotechnology, where I bring together business students at the Sloan School of Management with graduate students in biology and chemical engineering and biological engineering, and teach them how to talk to each other and learn about the latest developments in science underlying biotech companies but meet some of the leaders in biotech and also learn the fundamentals of finance and other things. And this notion of faculty entrepreneurs is important. Here is the founding scientific advisory board of Moderna. And what you will notice just from the names of the memberships in the National Academy is these are some of our very top scientists who start companies, you'll notice the chair of the advisory board, Jack Shostak, has a Nobel Prize. And you have people like uh, Betsy Nabel, who's president of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Bob Langer, who started many companies at MIT, and on it goes. So faculty entrepreneurs are very important. Land is very important. This is an aerial view of the same group that I showed you previously. Again, you can see Main Street running down to the Charles River. Here's MIT. This is where biotech is. This is 1970. It was cleared for a Nixon era space center that never materialized. But it grew up organically. It was not that you know, some government said, build biotech here. We first used that land to build the Whitehead Institute, opened in 1983. 
Eric Lander used the Whitehead Institute as his base for sequencing the human genome. I show this slide, which is the opening of the Broad Institute, to make a very important point about institutional collaboration. One of the reasons for success of biotechnology in Boston is that all of the major institutions and governments are collaborating and on the same page. The Broad Institute is a collaboration between Harvard, MIT, and the Harvard Teaching Hospitals, including Massachusetts General Hospital, the Brigham, Boston Children's Hospital, and so forth. These are institutions that traditionally compete with each other. But in biotech, we all work together. You can see this from this photograph at the opening of the Broad Institute. You have Eric Lander, who is both a professor at MIT and at Harvard University. Dr. Hockfield, the president then of MIT, Dr. Faust, the president of Harvard University, Mr. and Mrs. Broad, the governor, Jamal Patrick, who instituted the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center was there. The government is strongly behind this. And of course, David Baltimore, the Nobel laureate, um, who is the chairman of the board of the Broad Institute. Geography is very important. Faculty don't like to drive across town to go to their company. I know this sounds trite, but it is absolutely true. And one of the great successes of the Cambridge Biosystem is that it's all close together. So here is the Whitehead Institute at MIT. Here's the aforementioned Main Street. When I started Rubius Therapeutics, I did it with Flagship Ventures, whose office was a five minute walk down this direction. The first laboratories were in Lab Central. I'll discuss this in a moment, a state-supported incubator just a few minutes from Whitehead. When we outgrew Lab Central, we moved to rental space here, all within a walking distance of the MIT campus. And you can see from the names, this was a map that Phil Sharp drew up a number of years ago, locations of all other these are other venture firms uh, in blue are a number of companies that all surround MIT. And that's what makes it click. Boston, the Boston, uh, the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, I'll come to it in a moment, but it built a number of facilities, probably the most important was this incubator called Lab Central. As I said, it's a short walk up Main Street from MIT. It is a fully equipped, not-for-profit incubator in which all kinds of up-to-date lab equipment are available for everyone's use. At any one time, it will house about 30 startup companies. What makes it nice, you walk in and you see an open laboratory that would look like any open laboratory in your research institutes. But what makes it unique is your company can be one bench. You rent it for 5,000 US dollars a month. You can rent it on Friday and start working on Monday. It is competitive to get in. Only about a third of the companies convinced the management that they have both the science and the $2 million funding 
to qualify. But four of my own companies have thrived growing up in this type of environment. When you get too big for a lab bench, you can move into a private lab, still within Lab Central, for about 10 researchers. There are many incubators in Massachusetts, and these, many of them are university-based, many are commercial, but together they encourage the starting of a number of biotech companies. As I have stressed, starting a company is the easy part. Hiring five or six people is generally not difficult. It's going the next step. It's building the company from six to 30 and then to 100. And that's where a whole different level of planning and financing comes into play. There are surrounding MIT now large numbers of commercial real estate buildings that can accommodate companies of 100 or more people that can allow the companies to grow organically or pair back if the work doesn't go so well. So again, you can see Rubius, the company I started. As I said, we started at Lab Central. We moved to this site here. We then moved to another rental space to get bigger. And then finally, it's not even shown here, but a new building. And I also show here just along Main Street, I know many of you have been to MIT. You will not recognize Main Street because there are many large lab buildings, including this one, where several of the floors are Lab Central, but Lab Central for companies of 30 to 50 people. So you see, it's not just incubator space, but it's space for companies to grow and thrive. And additionally, we now have around Kendall Square, not just these incubators and companies, but we have a large cluster of colleges and universities that will train the people that will work in our laboratories. Uh, when I talk about the Mass Life Sciences Center, I'll talk about pre-college and college training. Because a large fraction of the people who work in biotech companies will not have PhDs or MDs. Many will have four-year degrees, some will not but they need to be trained to use the modern equipment to work carefully under sterile conditions and so forth. And this requires a broad spectrum of teaching institutions, which we now have in Boston. So we have incubators and lab space, we have venture capital firms, we now have as I said, 18 of the world's largest biopharmaceutical companies. They work, partner with, buy the startup companies because very few startup companies can go all the way to actually have a drug in the clinic. Almost all of us uh, of these companies will wind up partnering with or selling the company to a large pharmaceutical group. We have a supportive government and we can talk about that. And importantly, we have experienced leaders at all levels, not just highly trained and motivated PhD level researchers, but people experienced in the operation of biotech, 
experience in manufacturing, medicine, business, finance, law, government regulations, a lot of trained technicians and entry-level employees. So you get an idea of what we needed and what we built in Boston to build biotech. I just thought it'd be fun to take a break and tell you about the course that I've been teaching, the science and business of biotech. And it's basically a course with one odd purpose, to get the scientists and the business people talking to each other about biotechnology. I started teaching it, oh, seven years ago with Andrew Lowe, who's a professor of finance at the Sloan School of Management. And the goal is to give science-based students a business together with PhDs in science and engineering, insights into the current developments in biotechnology. So we have a series of lectures uh, that cover many of the important developments in biotechnology. And we have, I'll come back to this, we have many lessons on business topics, and they're all connected. We have outside speakers. I'll just give you one example. Um, a one-hour lecture that I gave on oligonucleotide therapies, nucleic acid therapies. I talked about antisense oligonucleotides, a company called Alnylam that uses antisense oligonucleotides to treat several liver diseases, particularly transthyretin amyloidosis. Following me, I had as a speaker, John Moraganori, who was the founding CEO of Alnylam, who talked about how he built the company from scratch, all the ups and downs and layoffs and 10 years of hard work before he got it approved. And then after me, Andrew Lowe spoke about how one can finance these long-term gene therapies. So you see the kind of topics that we cover so that the science students can understand the business and vice versa. We also have recitation sections. I have a Harvard M MD, PhD teaching assistant who gives a crash course to the business students on biology and immunology. And I have two senior teaching assistants from Sloan who give a crash course on business and finance to our biology and engineering students. And at the end of the course, they form small groups, write a business plan for a small startup company, and then present it to a group of four outside investors who do the evaluation of the project. Incredibly, all 11 projects this year, I wasn't surprised, got top rankings from the reviewers. These are really talented young people. But it's an example of the kind of course that we can do at MIT that really enables students to understand how this industry works. It's one of several courses. And it's also fun to teach. So if any of you think you might want to try something like that, I'd be happy to help you. Part of our course is already online as an edX course. 
which incredibly as an online course has had 30,000 students. So I argue there's considerable need for this kind of course. So let me talk then about two other topics that are related to the growth of biotechnology in Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, and particularly developing therapies for rare diseases. Now, the rules for the Mass Life Sciences Center may strike some of you as unusual. It is what is called a quasi-state agency. It reports not to the Secretary of Health or Education, but to the Secretary of Economic Development. It is financed by the state, but it has a completely independent board of directors, which makes all the decisions. In other words, the state provides the money, but the decision is made by an external board. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm seeing the reactions of several gentlemen in the front row that are very interesting. Um, but the center's independence has been key to its success. It supports and expands the life sciences industry. It focuses on workforce development. It focuses on the creation of well-paying jobs and on the development of drugs, diagnostic tests, medical devices, and so forth. In other words, it was created not just to develop drugs, but to create well-paying jobs and to train people to work in this industry. It was created by Governor Patrick for 10 years, uh, in, in 2008, for 10 years at $1 billion. It was recapitalized by the state for another $500 million in 2018. And it's up for renewal this year. It recognizes that life sciences is very broad in that it's just not just biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, it's medical devices, diagnostics, bioinformatics, genetics, increasingly agriculture and so forth. And it supports the development of multiple skill sets that are necessary for the success of a biotechnology ecosystem, not just science, engineering, uh, math, technology, but administration, animal husbandry, advertising and communications, computing, finance, legal, regulatory, logistics management, project management, sales, marketing, and particularly manufacturing. It is governed by an independent board. On the board are two of the cabinet ministers, the Secretary of Administration and Finance and the Secretary of Economic Development. Also the president of the University of Massachusetts system. But importantly, four of the seven are no connection with the state government but they're individuals with leadership qualifications in the biopharmaceutical industry. And you can see their names. For instance, Edward Benz, who served on the board, was the CEO of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Peter Parker uh, was the president of Lab Central and so forth. I was asked to chair the advisory board. And in fact, it's an interesting story. I was not at all planning to get involved in this agency. 
But in the fall of 2007, we had a 25th anniversary of the Whitehead Institute. And I was having my picture taken next to the governor. And this is at the very beginning of the Life Sciences Center. And I said to the governor, you know, I really like the idea of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, but you really need to generate a scientific advisory board that will advise the center both on the broad directions of its projects and also on every grant and contract to make sure that taxpayer money is well spent. And before I knew it that evening, this was a party, but I was in close discussion with his chief of staff. And I was then brought in front of the nascent board of directors that I just showed you. And they asked for my vision for an advisory board. And my vision was the only thing I knew, which was an NIH study section. But they asked me to put the board together, and I did. And as you can see just from the names, we have a standing group of academics, all of whom have been involved in starting or growing biotechs. We have a number of PhDs who lead companies. We have many managing partners of venture capital firms. And every grant and every proposal was read by at least one science trained person and one person from the business or venture capital community. Really three main topics or areas that the life sciences works in, um, $500 uh, million is infrastructure projects. I'll show you some of them in a moment. $250 million is tax relief. Companies get relief on their taxes if they hire a given number of individuals to work. And then finally, a $250 million fund that's used for grants and loans that help life science companies grow. Uh, you're all welcome to photograph this. I won't go into details here, but we have many programs that help small companies. Business plan competition for new companies, we have what we call the accelerator program, which would give up to $1 million as a forgivable loan to a small company to do something very specific that would get it over the so-called valley of death. And very often, when we would review and discuss these, our colleagues in the venture capital community would say, yes, you know, this company is too early for me now. But if they did A, B, and C that they plan to do in the next two years, we would be interested in investing in. One of the companies uh, was Moderna. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we have small business matching grants. There's a program through the federal government where companies can get small business grants. If they got them, we would match them to allow them to grow a little bit faster. And as I said, the tax incentive program. We built many buildings, uh, some on the campuses of the state university, uh, one at a private university, Worcester Polytechnic, a biomanufacturing education and training center, which didn't exist in Massachusetts. I mentioned Lab Central. We supported an expansion of the largest dental research institute in the United States, the Forsyth Dental Institute, developing a new type of diagnostics. Uh, we built Mass Biologics, a 
vector manufacturing center for gene therapy. And a very important thing that we did is support workforce development. We made many grants to vocational technical schools, community colleges, that is two-year institutions, organizations that train older people for workforce development, for supplies, for equipment, and so forth, matching funds that industry would donate. The notion is to train people so that they can work at a high level in these biotech companies, routine lab technicians, data entry, uh, manufacturing, operation of machines, things that need to be done rigorously, conscientiously, but do not necessarily need a four-year college education. A very important program is internships. And I'm particularly very proud of this program. Essentially, the Mass Life Sciences Center functions as what I'm told is a dating site. I've never been on a dating site. I don't need to. Um, but basically, students will submit their resumes. Companies will read them. And if there's a match, the state will pay for the student, I, I believe it's seven or eight thousand dollars to intern in the company. The restriction is the company can have no more than a hundred uh, employees. So we want the, the students to work in small companies. They can be biologists or chemists working in the laboratory. They can be economists, they can be computer scientists, they can be all kinds of things more or less half the students wind up working in these companies after graduation. But they will all tell you that it was a transforming life experience taking what they've learned in an academic institution and actually working in a company. If you don't have that in place here, it's pretty simple to do, and I would urge it. And finally, something that is very close to my heart, and you'll see why at the end, but rare diseases. Just as a preface, many of the rare diseases that we'll come to, they're autosomal recessive and they're enriched in specific ethnic groups because of consanguineous marriages and inbreeding over the ages. So I'll talk about some that are common in the United States, but there are many that are common in Asian communities, communities in the Middle East, communities in South Asia, East Asia and so forth, that are completely not characterized. Enormous opportunities. Oops. So we have in the United States, as I'll come to an orphan drug law to encourage development on these. But just to point out, there are 7,000 people tell me now there are eight or 9,000 rare diseases that have been characterized. Um, in the United States, a disease qualifies as an orphan or rare disease if it affects fewer than 200,000 US citizens. But roughly speaking, 10% of the world's population is said to suffer from one or another rare disease. The Orphan Degree Act in the United States passed 30 years ago gives you seven-year market exclusivity for a drug to treat an orphan disease. So it's not a patent protection. There's nothing to do with intellectual property. It simply says that the FDA will not license 
for seven years a drug to treat the same disease. And that was, as you'll see, essential for the development of companies like Genzyme. Just to point out a few examples I've called from the literature, you know, Iceland has a, a, an inherited early onset atrial fibrillation, another genetic disease, autosomal recessive, increasing risk of gallstones, similarly in Finland. Prenatal testing can work wonders in eliminating genetic diseases in defined populations. The one I often cite is this one, Doria Sharim, which relates to the Orthodox Jewish communities, mostly in Brooklyn, New York, but throughout the United States and the world. These are the ultra-religious who marry within their own community. And many diseases such as Tay-Sachs and Gaucher and many others are endemic within this community. The key to developing this screening was not the physicians, but it was the religious leaders, a rabbi who had several children with one of these genetic diseases and prayed to his God and said, God, I am a righteous man. Why are you punishing me with this genetic disease? And God said to him, prenatal testing. <laughs> and within a generation, they've eliminated these genes. It's all run not by the physicians, but the religious authorities, who are the leaders in these communities. And every young person, as they go through adolescence, the Jewish ceremony of bar mitzvah, has a blood sample taken. And now they are told the results. But when a couple wishes to marry, they go to the rabbi. And the rabbi enters their numbers in the computer and either says, yes, my children, God is looking favorably on this marriage, or I'm sorry, God does not look favorably, and uh, please find another partner. The point is, it works. So again, simple things that can be done that have great social effect. Um, for many years, I've been on the board of the Chinese Organization for Rare Diseases, encouraging in the PRC the understanding of the genetic diseases that are endemic, particularly in their minority populations, also in the hand population. Very little has been done. I think there are huge opportunities here. Just two examples, and then I'll end. Um, patient groups play an enormous role. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive lethal disease, common, most common in Northern Europeans, very little in Asians or other populations. But it's a mutation in the CFTR gene that when autosomal recessive causes cystic fibrosis. And the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation played a major role in supporting academic research on the disease. And in fact, supported research which identified virtually all of the common mutations. Vertex licensed a, actually bought a small company with a technology for screening drugs, rapidly screening drugs for cystic fibrosis. They decided not to pursue it because they were unsure of the market. And the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation invested 150 million of their dollars. They're a not-for-profit, but they invested in a for-profit company that ultimately led to the development of the cystic fibrosis drugs. And at the same time, virtually all of the CF children were genotyped 
So when the drugs became available, uh, they could enter rapidly the clinical trials. And in return, the CF Foundation got a royalty stream when the drugs were approved. They sold the royalty stream to a hedge fund called Royalty Pharma for three billion US dollars. So the CF Foundation now has this enormous reservoir which they are spending supporting research on gene therapies for cystic fibrosis and other lung diseases. Uh, Truth in Advertising, one of my companies is a recipient of their funding. So there are many ways of getting this work funded. I just want to end with a story about Genzyme. And as you'll see, it's also a very personal story. Genzyme was started by eight of us on the MIT faculty. Scientists with expertise in a whole lot of fields. But it was Henry Tremere, the business person, an MBA, uh, who had the vision that one could build a company on drugs for rare diseases, a very profitable company. And the first disease that we tackle is found mostly in Ashkenazic or Eastern European Jews called Gaucher disease. So lysosome storage disease uh, that is missing an enzyme, glucocerebrosidase, which is essential for the degradation of a particular glycolipid, glucocerebroside. Uh, the most common type, type 1, is generally not fatal, but it's very debilitating, affects the liver, the spleen, the bones. Um, expanded liver, expanded spleen, and so forth, and leads to a whole lot of disease characteristics, sometimes death. Uh, what Genzyme, or I helped develop, is the enzyme replacement. It is a recombinant protein. It's the recombinant glucocerebrosidase. But we had to modify the sugars attached to the protein such that they had terminal mannose residues that would be targeted to the mannose receptor on macrophages, which is the major cell that needs it. There was a protein that targets it to a specific cell type based on glycoengineering. And that really made the company, it went public in 1989, and shortly after I left the company. But that's not why I'm telling you the story. Gaucher disease is most common in descendants of Eastern European Jews. Twelve years later, in 2002, our oldest daughter was pregnant. She and her husband, of Eastern, US, Eastern European Jewish descent, were offered a battery of genetic tests to see whether they were carriers of any of these diseases. And indeed, both my daughter and her husband were carriers of Gaucher, which of course meant that the child had a one in four chance of having the disease. Now, what I haven't told you is that depending on the alleles, if there's no enzyme or very little enzyme, you will have types two or three Gaucher, which involve brain damage and early death. So our daughter understandably was scared, had amnio done, and has me take the call from the geneticist who said, Dr. Lodish, yes, your daughter said I could speak to you. you know, I'm really sorry, the child your daughter is carrying has Gaucher disease. Now, I had the sense to ask what were the alleles. One was a frame shift 
The other was an arginine dehistidine, which I presumed would give enough enzyme so that it would be type one, the type treatable was grandpa's help, the drug his grandpa helped develop. And uh, through a number of geneticists, I won't go into the details, that turned out to be the case. Andrew was born. He's been on the genzyme serazyme for, well, he's now 20 years old. He's never been sick a day in his life from Gaucher disease. I have to show you, here he is bicycling across the United States with a group of friends. And that is really the reason we're in biotechnology. I had no idea that when I helped start Genzyme, it would eventually lead to the treatment of one of my own grandchildren. But that's the world we live in. <laughs> Genzyme has since developed drugs for a number of other rare diseases, led to normal lives for thousands of children and young adults who otherwise would suffer debilitating symptoms. And that's why we're in the business we're in. I'm done. I'll leave this slide up because if any of you are interested in the edX course, you can sign up. It's free. Thank you. Okay, thank you for Dr. Lodish. Give us uh, such a wonderful talk. Yeah, yes, it's very, very inspiring. Uh, so speechy. So I think uh, we can take a few questions from the audience. Is there any question? Right, Dr. Zhang. Trying to uh, reimagine, uh, you know, you had that map, uh, the uh, early uh, 1980s or late 1970s, the aerial map of uh, Cambridge at yeah. that time. So, um, uh, Taiwan is a very late comer uh, for biotech development, and you, as uh, here, here is the, the one of the newest. Uh, science park, which uh, uh, we don't know what we model after, but I think the best place we want to model after actually is the MIT, <laughs> the Cambridge Life Science Center. So, so can you bring us back to that moment in time when there was nothing yet? <laughs> okay. I think it's very important for the audience today because uh, later uh, we have our panelist and what I'm going to do later will be very different uh, from all our discussions because today I, I would like you to interact with all the incubators represented from all all parts of Taiwan, from here, from central Taiwan, from uh, southern Taiwan. So can you bring us back to some time in 1980? What is it like and, what and it how you started a company? <laughs> well, we started, uh, there were no incubators. Um, we started Genzyme on the it was empty space. It was the 12th floor of a building near Tufts Medical School in what they called Chinatown. Uh, the first 11 stores were ladies off the shelf retail clothing. And we built the Genzyme Labs on the top floor. And that's where we developed Sarazyme. When the company grew, it moved to two-story buildings on Binney Street that were probably half kilometer walk from MIT in the Whitehead. And that was our first building in Kendall Square. Thank you for a question. Where did you get the initial funding from whom? Okay, Genzyme did not depend on venture capital. Henry Tremere, we bought Koch Light, 
which was a catalog company. This was Henry Tremere's vision. Venture capital didn't exist. He wanted to be self-supporting. We bought a catalog company that sold chemical reagents. And we developed some of the reagents for these automatic um, blood diagnostic machines that paid enough of the bills that we could build the company. So it was very much, you know. So you earned your own. In work. that case, we earned our own money. A second company, Damon Biotech, we started about the same time. That was to make monoclonal antibodies. It was an offshoot of Damon Corporation, which was a large equipment manufacturer. And they funded it, and then various banks funded it. There were an awful lot of banks. Venture capital didn't exist then. Um, I had a backyard conversation with a neighbor. She happened to have graduated from Berkeley in chemistry and an MBA from MIT and was working at a bank and brought me to lunch. And I was talking with the bankers and they offered me $10 million to start a company. And some of that went, if I remember, to Damon Biotech. You know, there was a lot of excitement back then because everyone wanted to get into cloning. You see, so that kind of, you know, pushed it. And then, of course, once the product started coming out, Genzyme's first product was not a recombinant product. It was the glucocerebrosidase, but it was made from human placenta. 20,000 human placenta uh, for one person's treatment a year. So, and it was very much hand to mouth back then, but it rapidly grew and you know, by the mid 80s, Genzyme was a functional company where a number of banks had invested. So, you know, then because we had to clear the land near Kendall Square, then other buildings started going up. A key guy, Joel Marcus, started Alexandria Real Estate. And he started building many of the lab buildings on spec to house the companies that would grow out of whatever incubator space there was. Uh, about 25 years ago, Joel realized that if a biotech company moved into his lab space, they were probably doing okay. And he started investing in biotech. Alexandria is the largest investor in biotech in the United States. It's a real estate company, okay? And they have commercial um, incubator space. So it grew up, you know, in a lot of stages. There is a wonderful book on the history of Kendall Square that was just published that I urge you to read. I know the author, Babaduri is the author. I know him well. The history of Kendall Square. It's called the history of Kendall Square. It goes through, you know, even in the 19th century when it was a clothing center and all kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry, it was a long-winded answer, but it's a great <laughs> question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, I didn't volunteer. You didn't volunteer. But, but now that I got the microphone. <laughs> You mentioned Damon Biotech. It's pleasure vu to me. Uh, that's the company that provided the first batch of the Chimeric 1418. I don't know if you still remember anti-GD2 antibody for my phase one clinical trial. Well. And then it went to Abbott and Abbott, Abbott won't make it. <laughs> right, Ab Abbott bought the company. We were too early in manufacturing monoclonal antibodies. You know, there just wasn't the market back then to do it. And also, we had, a, we had a weird technology. The idea was to encapsulate the monoclonal antibody, the, the producing cells, 
and alginate capsules such that the secreted antibody would stay within the capsule. And that was supposed to enhance purification. And it worked, but it was rapidly taken over by serum-free media. And we didn't need all this fancy stuff to purify the antibody. So yeah, Abbott bought it because of the antibodies that we made, and then the company itself closed. Having said that, I had you know, stock in the company. And my wife has an MBA and knew what to do with it. <laughs> Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed guests, Professor Harvey Lodish, first and foremost, I want to express my gratitude for the invitation to speak today. It's truly an honor for me. In the next 10 minutes, I will want to share how and why we brought Professor Harvey Lodish to Taiwan and the impact we believe his visit would have. And, and toward the end, I will also talk about what's next, our next step. Back in 2019, I was studying public health in Boston. And let me tell you, if you are in the realm of uh, public health, you understand the frustration of great ideas not translating into better health. So with all due respect to my alma mater, uh, we need more than just powerful ideas to make our world healthier, because powerful ideas might not guarantee a healthier world. So I, I embarked on a personal journey to figure out how we can transform ideas into real world solutions. It started with a course called Translational Pharmacology. We spent three intensive weeks learning from unmet medical needs to preclinical and clinical stage all the way to pharmacoepi. It blew my mind when I heard that the organizer of the, of the course mentioned that he had been waiting for Harvard Medical School to teach this course for three decades. Another surprise is to hear a former Harvard professor turned biotech CEO say that when he left academia for entrepreneurship 20 years ago, his colleague made fun of him. Hey, that guy went over, went across the river. And now uh, it's the opposite. A scholar would get command for crossing the river, I mean, Charles River, and start a biotech company on the other side. So that was what drew me to Sloan, the management school of MIT. I wanted to cross Charles River and see what was happening on the other side. And there I discovered this class that I already mentioned, taught by Professor Andrew Law, a finance expert, and today's esteemed, esteemed speaker, Professor Harvey Lodish. This school was so in demand that you had to go through a lottery system just to register. I think I, by the time I noticed, I passed the time for the lot, uh, lottery. So professor probably had override the rule for me to get in. So, okay. The class was a mixture of MBA student and bioscience student. For many of us bioscience folks, the first half of the class was a crash course in finance. We were introduced to concepts like shops ratio, net present value, company evaluation, and there were even more advanced uh, finance topics like learning from Hollywood, de-risking through slate financing. I think this is given by the founder of uh, Royal Pharma who purchased the loyalty of Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that was mentioned by Harvey Lodish, uh, Professor Harvey. Um, and there's another one, how to start a biotech company if you must. The MIT resource is available for student entrepreneurs. So in the second half, I think that's the first half of the time, taught by Professor Harvey Lodish, drove into different therapeutic platforms and the science behind them. As you can imagine, it was quite a challenge for students from those other backgrounds uh, to grasp the intricacies. So thankfully, we have those uh, cap capable TAs from a finance PhD and also two from bioengineering PhD that gave us recitation. Basically, it's the crash course. In Chinese, it's called Pusiban for us to catch up. And the final presentation. We had to conduct a financial analysis of a biotech investment. Those who graded our presentation were some of Boston's top venture capitalists and seasoned entrepreneurs. 
For example, someone just sold his company for $9 billion. Among my classmates, there was one who just graduated from Tainan Yichong, a high school from southern Taiwan. Uh, he was in his first year undergrad at, at MIT. Uh, I think he's in his 18-ish age year old. And his team's presentation outshone my team, which made me a bit envious. Made me a bit envious. And by the way, my teammate uh, to my right, Steve, a French guy from MBA program, he said that he had never taken a biology class since high school. And then he became an invest, investment banker with JP Morgan Healthcare right after graduation. Can you believe that? So I have this question. What if we could offer similar opportunities for exposure for our younger generation in our higher education system in Taiwan? So during the course, we had several guest speakers. One of them was Jody Cook, the founder of Agilis Therapeutics. She came to talk about her company, Agilis. Jody managed to raise a million US dollars starting Agilis in 2013. In 2015, she attended a presentation made by Professor Paul Hu, Wu Liang Jiao, from National Taiwan University at the ASGCT annual meeting. Professor Hu showcased a video showing significant improvement in patients after gene therapy for ADC, which is a rare disease causing severe motor and developmental deficiencies. This led Agilis to enter into a sponsor research agreement and an exclusive worldwide license agreement with NTU Aida, in January 2016. Jody in the class told us that she spent the whole day, entire Sunday, just one day, writing a NIH proposal and got it. So NIH granted Agilis a in-kind non-diluted capital in collaboration with, under, under the program of TRND, Therapeutic of Rare and Neglected Disease. That collaboration is, uh, worth 7 million US dollars. It involved 40 diverse experts in pharmacology, toxicology, portfolio management, and IP protection from NIH to support the portfolio for free. In 2016, the FDA granted rare disease designation for the drug. In 2017, FDA had accepted the submission of BLS, uh, BOA. In 2018, PTC Therapeutic acquired Agilis for an upfront payment of US $200 million and milestone payment of uh, $745 million US dollars. So totally at $1 billion US dollars. And currently I realize half of that money, which is half billion, uh, had been already paid. And in May 2022, the therapy received marketing authorization from EMA. And a few months ago, uh, NICE in UK signed a deal with PTC to provide the therapy to patients. The reported cost per dose was 3.7 million US dollars. So from licensing to reaching the best side, the patients, it only took seven years. In the class, the director from NIH NCAT Nora Young, who was the key person to the NIH Agilis collaboration, was present. So I can't help but raise my hand and ask this burning question. I ask, so the technology is from Taiwan, and nearly all the patients that participated in the pivotal evidence were Taiwanese or, uh, rare disease patient. I mean, even a, a neurosurgeon from NTU must have uh, introduced the AAV therapy intracranially, I mean, into the putamen. So nearly everything is done in Taiwan. So I raised the question, then what did the PI or NTU gain from this? So Jody Ko uh, hesitated for a few seconds and she said, well, he's a physician, he wanted to treat his patient, so we sponsored the research for him to treat his patient. But the majority of the work and the value were created after licensing. Well, as much as I am patriotic, 
I don't think I would say I'm totally, I found it totally unfair, the statement made by Jody. If you had read about uh, how much work that's been invested after the licensing. So that actually led to a more question of mine. I ask, have the technology been licensed to a local company in Taiwan? Could that company create the same value and bring the same results? If not, what does it take to help that company get there? What are the essential elements or paradigm shifts needed in Taiwan? What are the best practices for a tech transfer office? How can we do more in our higher education system to foster academic entrepreneurship and student entrepreneurships? So right after the class ended, I flew back to Taiwan and gave a commencement speech at NTU. I shared the video with Harvey and he wrote to me and said, well, I'm very curious about what you will wind up doing. Please let me know and I will see how I can help you. So I waited for one, two years and I wrote to him, Professor, I promise that I'll tell you what I'm gonna do after I graduated. I helped develop a COVID vaccine for my own country. Uh, but please come and lend us your expertise but not just for my company, but for the entire ecosystem. So, and that brings us to this purpose of inviting Professor Harvey Lodish. He will be providing guidance and advice in various ways. We advise 10 biotech startups, uh, now the number is still growing, or translational research teams on one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, it was starting from this afternoon. We'll visit three biomedical incubation hubs, including TMU and TTA and Yaming Jiao Tong. Uh, some are hospital-based, some are university-based. You will visit decision-maker at a very high level of our government, and, and, and probably that person will receive a copy of molecular cell biology signed by a professor. And a banquet with academ academic entrepreneurs and students. So what's next? We are already in talk with professor. Uh, we're discussing the possibilities of bringing an even more diverse team to Taiwan next year. The team could include head of MIT Technology Licensing, Mass Bio, Mass Life Science Center, expert from Lab Central, MIT Sloan, and several individuals from the venture capital and venture philanthropy sectors. We're considering running an academy or similar class, the Science and Business of Biotech in Taiwan, within an academic institute. To explore potential collaborations, we will be reaching out to some of you in the audience, and your expertise and input will be invaluable. In conclusion, I want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for your time and attention. Together, let's work toward creating a thriving ecosystem for academic and student entrepreneurships. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What I'm trying to do next is trying to maximize uh, what we can learn from Dr. Lodish. Okay, so, so this will not be the traditional panel discussion in, a, in that sense. Okay, uh, in the conference when we do panel discussion, we want to have a common theme, but uh, today what I'm going to do is to invite Dr. Lodish as an advisor. Uh, okay. So, uh, Ellen, uh, you will be the teaching assistant. <laughs> and so next, I'll, I'm going to invite five, uh, five uh, incubators uh, from Academia Research Center in Taiwan, kind of representative uh, of the ecosystem in Taiwan. And each one of you, you will present to Dr. Lotish what your center is doing. Uh, and then I'll invite, because of, because of the need for photo opportunity, everybody still need to get up. And then I'll invite Dr. Lodish uh, to, to ask questions or comments uh, on these centers. And if you have questions, please, you can, you can ask uh, why you are on stage or you can ask why you are sitting on, on stage. Uh, just to save my own time, 
there will be five uh, speakers. Uh, uh, the first one will be Dr. Su uh, Xiaoming. Please, uh, Dr. Su Xiaoming. So, so, so he he will introduce uh, BioTrack. This is the Bio Medical uh, Incubation Center for Academia Seneca. Uh, the second, uh, the second speaker will be uh, Professor Cai Jingwu. Cai Jingwu is from Yangming Jiao Tong University. Uh, briefly. It's a marriage, merger of the two university. Uh, one is a medical school, one is a, a, a specialty in ICT, which is very famous now because Taiwan has become the tension point of geopolitical <laughs> tension between uh, US, China, and, and so on and so forth. So, so, um, Thank you, Dr. Lodish, for coming to this uh, one of the most dangerous city in the world. <laughs> Perhaps you will find uh, there's not, not much danger here. And the third speaker uh, will be Dr. Zhang Zhihan. Uh, Dr. Zhang Zhihan is uh, from Chen uh, Gong University from South. And the first speaker will be <coughs> Dr. Joey Tani, Chen Zhao Wei Zixinzhang, who is from TMU, Taipei Medical uh, University. And last but not least is Oscar Li Guangshan, uh, Dr. Li Guangshan from China Medical University Hospital in Central Taiwan. China Medical in University is not in China. Uh, it's in Taiwan, <laughs> okay, <laughs> because they originally they are starting uh, as a first traditional Chinese medical school uh, in Taiwan, so they, they adopt the name. Okay, so without further ado, let me uh, in, invite uh, uh, Dr. Si Xiaoming, yes, please. Okay, uh, Dr. Lodish and the distinguished guests, uh, it's my turn to introduce about the National uh, Biotechnology Research Park today. Um, this part is uh, quite new, actually, uh, uh, starting uh, 2018 and uh, late 2018, and it is a research-oriented uh, biotechnology park. And so it's different from uh, several other parks and uh, in, in uh, the other part of Taiwan. And I think it's uh, part of the, the very distinguished uh, uh, issue is that it's nearby the Academic Seneca. Academic Seneca is the, I think it's a top, it's a very high uh, research uh, environment. Uh, lots of the uh, research going on in Taiwan. And so uh, this part nearby, not only for uh, a lot of the uh, in, uh, collaboration between the original scientists have the technology transfer to uh, national, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, national park. And also uh, in nearby have the uh, Ministry of the Health and Wel Welfare, and that uh, consists of this uh, CDC and FDA. And also uh, in this uh, park is quite nearby this Taipei Bio Innovation Park. It is, this just, uh, uh, funding a couple of uh, months ago that uh, we ha we will have the uh, collaboration in the near future and to build a strong uh, biotechnology development in this area. Besides, I think the most uh, beauty of this uh, biotechnology development in Taipei uh, uh, is due to there's a child medical center nearby, and so we, that facilitated the clinical trial uh, in Taipei area. And also, uh, not only about technology development, uh, Nangang Nehu uh, Technology Park also have the, a lot of the IC, a lot of the, we have the, this is so, uh, a combination for development. So I think within this area, uh, the park have the, its own unique uh, identity, not only for research, for incubation, but also have to build this ecosystem in Taipei City. This this part uh, consists of the uh, several buildings. Uh, we currently uh, at this uh, this C building, 
uh, there's an incubation center, uh, also same for BioHub Taiwan. And the, uh, the A building is for the translational uh, med medicine center. Uh, our director, uh, Wuhan Zhong, uh, lead this uh, entire uh, this three unit as a core uh, somatic uh, center and, uh, and so on. Okay. And this, uh, uh, this building not only uh, uh, affiliated with Academy Sinica, you also uh, the, build, uh, the building uh, DCB Development Center for Biotechnology associated with the Ministry of the Economic Affairs. And also the building F is a Taiwan FDA. Uh, this is quite important for this reg, uh, law and regulation. And also uh, the, the building uh, provide a National Laboratory Animal Center uh, is funded by uh, the National Science and Technology uh, Council. So this uh, this cell building through this uh, connection and so that we're able to, to build this ecosystem to facilitate all this innovative uh, company uh, to grow. Uh, in Balti, uh, the, this is a, a structure uh, leading by the director Wu and, and also had uh, two deputy directors, Dr. Lin Longxing, Dr. Li Wenshan, and we have a full uh, major division uh, uh, group. Uh, in the uh, CEO, the Tami Hua, is the translational medicine division, uh, engaged in this translational medicine research and, and the core facility, as well as the, to, to help this uh, commercialization of the clinical application. For research team, uh, I am in this uh, so-called uh, BioHub uh, Taiwan. Uh, we we have a mission to to build this comprehensive biotech ecosystem to have the integrate all these resources for the company and the uh, translation research team to development. And also, we have the NRPD uh, Academy that a lot of the course and the education training course for. Uh, 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 the staff and also uh, the biotechnology uh, translation research team. And also the, we also build this uh, BioHub Taiwan Accelerator that uh, partnership with the 27 cooperation and VC entity to support the startup company. And uh, uh, another one is Intelligent Medicine Division led by uh, Dr. Li Longxing, uh, also as a duty director. Uh, this is infrastructure for medical imaging, multi-omic or big data analysis Information platform for uh, disease prevention, early diagnosis, and precision medicine as well. And also, uh, uh, Dr. Ling, uh, due to his expertise, he has uh, this uh, drug target development for exploration and uh, virtual drug screening. And uh, due to the COVID 19, we have the uh, Dr. Derek, uh, uh, Ling had a comprehensive this, uh, for P2P3 establishment and for rapid and diagnosis screening for anybody and the drug development. And this part, I think, is quite important to help uh, not only the, uh, the provide the lab space, uh, recruit the talent, technology transfer, and also have an included regulation and fund uh, support to to allow this uh, new company to, to grow. So this is the entire uh, resource that we provide uh, to support uh, from the research team to a uh, new uh, uh, novel uh, innovative uh, company. And I briefly, due to the time limit, so I, I will go through quickly. Uh, this part have consists of the uh, nine uh, core facilities, including the medicine, chemistry, uh, analytical chem uh, uh, core, and the human antibody, RNA technology, and nuclear AC, uh, AC vaccine, and ta uh, Taiwan mass cleaning, uh, animal imaging, core facility for translation medicine, infectious disease, core, and time barbing, I think. Later, uh, late afternoon, we will introduce more about the time bobbing. And this is not only the, for the lab space and uh, core facility uh, that uh, allowed uh, this company to to use. I think this is quite important, not uh, especially in you know, for this part. It's uh, to help the you know you don't need to buy the uh, uh, the, the import, uh, very uh, heavy machine, but use the core as the for the development. Uh, we also have so-called this uh, acad uh, NRP, uh, uh, MERP Academy that uh, to help to, to, to teach, to, uh, to, to provide a workshop, business print read, writing and the pattern marking uh, analysis, uh, clinical regula regulation, 
and so on. So I think uh, this is uh, provide, uh, I think there's a way to learn from the uh, technology I mentioned today uh, that uh, maybe we can in integrate more uh, information from uh, MIT and uh, Y Institute as well. Uh, in addition, uh, we also uh, 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 have a lot of the, uh, this activity like NRP, uh, MBRP demo date uh, every year that we can facilitate a lot of inter industrial collaboration resource connection and more than this uh, uh, 500 international and domestic uh, collaboration to, to attend. And we also, in the past few years, we uh, facilitated this uh, pitch day, facilitated different company and the uh, engine uh, to have the uh, uh, R&D uh, development. And so I think uh, not only this, uh, we also uh, met all these uh, international conference and uh, exhibition to uh, demonstrate, to show, you know, the energy and the first to make all these connections for uh, the innovative uh, team research and, and also the company to have the more international exposure and, and connection. And so uh, this part, so, so apparently that uh, Valtteri provide this uh, accelerator that as I mentioned that we have 27 uh, uh, corporate to have uh, this cooperation that to help to to nurture uh, this innovate uh, innovative company and uh, to to uh, to grow. And currently, they have forty five resident company and uh, four existing incubation. So, uh, I will try to draw your attention: eight staff from uh, eight company staff from academic Sinica and nine technology transfer from Academic Sinica. So uh, I think it's quite very impressive, almost 100% uh, uh, occupied it. And so uh, currently they have that like 20, 2,500 uh, people present in this area. Not only for the innovative company, we also have the translational uh, uh, group, uh, like 23 uh, and six of us have already uh, from the company. And so I'll draw your attention about this is uh, in this part, we almost cover uh, almost 30% of this uh, town Baten industrial value. So it's about 10 uh, billion US dollar. And in the end, uh, not only for the development, but I thought it's quite important to have the uh, natural uh, preservation. And so uh, we have, uh, have this sustainability of this biopark development. Thank you for your attention. And, uh, and honorable guests. And uh, today I will represent uh, a National Yang Ming Jiao Tong University to present you the development of biotechnology at uh, National Ta uh, Yang Ming Jiao Tong University, or NYCU. As uh, uh, Dr. Zhang just uh, said, that uh, you know, our universities are merger from uh, uh, Yang Ming University and Jiao Tong University, uh, which is uh, medical school versus engineering. So uh, traditionally, uh, the Jiao Tong University has a lot of alumni who has now served in the uh, Xinzhu uh, uh, Tech Park as the CEO or top level uh, managers. For example, uh, CC Wei uh, or uh, Wei, Wei Zhejia is the CEO of TSMC. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yang Liu uh, is the chairman of Foxconn. So we have uh, the, the, the breadth of these alumni who has a lot Succeed, succeeded in the, uh, the semiconductor industry and, and computer science, uh, we are now moving into the um, medical uh, uh, industry. And with the uh, merger with Yang Ming University and the medical school now, uh, we are going into a new era. So uh, our Office of Research and Development has a center uh, for uh, the academic uh, and industry cooperation. And we have several divisions, uh, such as Center for uh, Entrepreneurship and Incubation. And we also have a, a, a technology license office and also legal and collaboration. We try to merge all of these services together into one stop uh, a service. 
And of course, we need to go from the pre-commercial to the marketing, also the IP serv service. And we are with the uh, uh, several funds that are now within the campus uh, uh, donated by and uh, virtual uh, the uh, alumni, also uh, some of the connections with the venture capital. Now we are now trying to bridge all these resources into uh, uh, with our uh, 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 research in the medical uh, area. And also, we also have some uh, human uh, resource help. And this is what we are trying to build. We have uh, the students' ideas. We have new uh, uh, inventions from the faculty and also ideas from uh, collaboration between the industry and the academia. We have the uh, licensing, of licensing office, incubation center, and also we have uh, course training, uh, as just mentioned by uh, Dr. Lodish, we also have uh, 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 professors who are now teaching uh, courses for entrepreneurship. And afterwards, um, people now can have uh, access to the uh, angel funds and also other funds uh, by our alumni, also other venture capitals. Now, we are hoping that we can have uh, high quality startups. And of course, afterwards, uh, which is very, very, kind of very, very difficult, we now need to uh, work with the international partners and we are trying to uh, focus on not only the Taiwan uh, market, but also the EU, uh, the US, uh, the North America, uh, China and Japan markets. And of course, there are government uh, 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 supports. So everything we hope that we can use whatever we can access to uh, have a, a good uh, incubation uh, and startup uh, environment here at NYCU. Of course, we need to have our focus because the resource is limited. So we focus on three different um, areas. One is semiconductor, the other is the net zero carbon emission or green energy areas. And today I'm going to talk about the smart medicine and healthcare uh, uh, areas that we want to focus on. And uh, here uh, at NYC, we, we have four different incubation centers, and some of them are for semiconductor, green energy. But now we have a uh, Shilin, a new uh, incubation building that is still under construction, but hopefully it will finish uh, sometime uh, by the end of this year. And uh, the um, the Shilin building is very close to the new Beitou uh, Shilin Technology Park. Right now, it is still of empty land with a lot of constructions going on. It's just like, you know, uh, Boston at that time, maybe 30 years ago. So we are hoping that we can have connection with the uh, science park, technology park here, and also not far from the, our Beitou uh, campus here, uh, there is Taipei Veterans General Hospital. And so we have a connection of, of all of these uh, components within three miles of, uh, in distance. And we also is also building our own uh, smart hospital right now, um, uh, which will be in Xinju. And we want to focus on only uh, not only that, but also digital health, AI medicine device, and, and active uh, aging. We also have collaborations internationally uh, with other uh, funding agencies and so on. So our strategy is that we uh, will have a team to uh, assist the new startup companies to in incubate ideas and then coordinate to join, for example, trade shows to show off their ideas. And also, uh, we, we can have some meetings to uh, have uh, targets and also review. And then we hope that uh, these uh, new ideas can then move out to the spin of companies. And uh, the fundings uh, here we have Every uh, month, we have a spotlight meetings and to in, uh, uh, invite uh, different uh, small or startup groups and also outside reviewers to get uh, improvements on their business ideas. And also, we have the lead pitch, uh, that's, which is semi, uh, semi annual. And we are now trying to um, collaborate with industry and also funding agencies. Here, I just want to give you uh, one example that has been ongoing, which is trying to uh, treat Alzheimer disease using a new uh, small compound. And as you all know, that Alzheimer disease is, is a, 
uh, a huge uh, mathematical uh, needs. And uh, this, uh, this year, there is probably only one uh, that uh, 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 treatment that is uh, approved by FDA, which is uh, antibody to against the anti-amyloid beta. But the data is kind of controversial, but uh, this is actually the first step uh, to uh, hopefully can modify the progression of Alzheimer's disease. But what's next? And so all the other companies are now uh, trying to uh, uh, generate antibodies. And as myself, actually, I was uh, working in, at Genentech, also developing uh, antibodies for, uh, for uh, Alzheimer's disease. But that approach, is that the, the best approach? Maybe there are also other approaches, for example, inflammation. So neuroinflammation is also a big hallmark of the many neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. So around this uh, plaque, there are a lot of activated microglia, and maybe which is uh, in, uh, initially beneficial, but you know, long-term inflammation may cause further damage in the brain. So people have, start, have studied the inflammation status of uh, AD patients, and indeed, they found that the inflammation will increase, um, uh, will increase uh, uh, with the, the uh, disease progression. So can we target uh, this neuroinflammation? So we uh, actually did, uh, develop a new drug that is uh, targeting the uh, microglia receptor, which is called CSF1R. And the small compound has actually a very good chemical, very good chemical property. Uh, there are also, of course, competitors. For, uh, for example, uh, there is this uh, AB, Bios, uh, uh, AB Science, the French uh, corporation, they have a small molecule, and also a Japanese company, also a small molecule against the, the CSF1R. But this molecule has much, much higher affinity to CSF1R, and also it has very little side effects on other kinases. And it is well tolerated, and it was actually approved. The IND was approved. The phase one was done in the United States, and uh, actually the, the, the healthy pe people are well tolerated uh, with this uh, small molecule. And the best thing is that the blood brain barrier penetrate is 97% which is very, very high. So it's actually, you can just take the pill and hopefully it will treat uh, your Alzheimer's disease. And even more interestingly is that there are good microglia and bad microglia, and our data shows that in the mouse model, if you take this, uh, uh, the, this drug, actually it will improve the cognitive uh, uh, impairment, and also you can decrease the microglia, but it did not eliminate all microglia, it just eliminated some microglia that are around the plaques, which is very, very interesting. So now, uh, this is a collaboration between our Advanced Therapeutic Research Center and Elixiron, a startup company which is actually uh, focusing on immune therapies. And now we are trying to spin off a new company that is focusing on neuro and uh, aging. And uh, this, uh, this uh, drug is also got the funding from the Alzheimer's Disease Association two times uh, for phase one and phase two trials. Actually, this is the first Asian company that got this okay. funding. Okay. Okay, so you need to cut problem. a little bit short. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and I really appreciate uh, Dr. Rodish, uh, your sharing. Inspire me a lot, okay, especially we can see the region or value there because my sharing uh, is a little bit different. Okay, we are not focused on the biotech, we are kind of focused on medical tech, which I mentioned is a medical device, in particular. Okay, my name is Chi Han Zhang. I'm working as a director on the Medical Device Innovation Center, as well as the Office of Translation, uh, Technology Translation Office. Okay, I have to use this one here. Okay, uh, this is our campus. Well, we are established by Japanese, okay, in 1931. And this is the first building of our university. Okay, so I call my campus a modern classic. We have very modern building as well as very classical building there. Okay, this is the composition of our university. Here we have nine major college, okay, one, as well as one medical center. We have roughly uh, 20,000 uh, 20, uh, students. Roughly half are graduate and half, the other half are undergraduate. We have more than 18,000, oh, sorry, 108,000 research. And 
more importantly, we have more than 200,000 alumni. Okay, they are very good resource for this university. Uh, I think uh, Director Wu here is also an alumni. Okay, distinguished alumni. <laughs> okay, and I'll just skip this one because as suggested by uh, President Zhang there, I should focus more on the background, not, not the background information, but more on how we do it and so that Dr. Rodish can give us more comment. And this is some of our, we are very proud of our academic industry cooperation here. Okay, actually, let me skip this one here, using this one to write to you. Actually, we are ranked as number one in the Thais Higher Education University ranking here, okay, in the category of industry income. Okay, unfortunately, this category only weighs 2.5% for the total ranking here, there. Okay, and we are ranked as also number 96 at, uh, uh, in the category of U.S. patent granted. However, we don't value how much patent we have. What we value is how much, how many patent, okay, we license. Okay, because university won't execute the patent, we ask, will not execute the technology. So we value how much technology we sell, okay? Yes, I have to mention this one here. Unfortunately, okay, the value of our patent is only uh, for the last year is uh, 110,000 per patent we sell. Okay, and I'll just give this one. Okay, because we are a comprehension university, so our patent covered a lot of uh, very diverse technology background. Okay, and from, I think it's roughly at the 2011, our university start, okay, the startup program. We try to incubate our entrepreneur in our campus there. Okay, and we, the number of startup company, okay, grows. And again, the background or the business domain of the star company is very diverse in our team, star team here. In our university, actually we are doing a two track incubation for the startup. The first one we call Lean Startup. Mostly it's based on the uh, idea of the student. Okay, so the key, man, uh, the key target is time to market. How fast we can deliver this idea, okay, to the market. And the second track is research translation, okay, based on the lab technology developed uh, by the professor there. And this requires a lot of resource, okay. So this is for the student, okay, program. Okay, so we have the dream come true program every year. If the performance, the winner will send to the youth star, which they can, the star company can get from, from the Minister of Education. And this is the, Translation for MATAC, okay, in our university. One is the bar design, the Stanford Taiwan bar design program, and the other one is SPARC, also a program we uh, learned from the SPARC, uh, from the Stanford University over there. Okay, in total, we incubate more than 90 okay, startup team, and we found more than 20 startup company, and they raised about a capital of 12 million US dollar. They receive about 30, 30 licensing from TFDA and two licensing from FDA there. Okay, oh, behind all this uh, academia industry cooperation, okay, we have an innovation headquarter. Okay, in this headquarter, we have over 50 full-time professional and also provide a one-stop service for all this kind of pattern or uh, technology transfer or startup incubation there. And this is the, uh, office I serve in right now uh, for the technology transfer. And we also have a accelerator, although it's called accelerator, but I mean, we didn't perform like a regular accelerator there. It's just a kind of incubation, more like an incubation. Okay, and the other platform is a medical device innovation center. And this center is established in 2011, okay, uh, based on the funding from the Minister of Education and it's continued found, okay, uh, in the, tw uh, 2018 as well as 2023 this year. Okay, and for the second phase of this MDIC, we are focused on the translation of, uh, and for the startup or technology transfer. Okay, so we try to build an ecosystem for this medical device research translation there. We try to build a workforce 
okay, to do the education, to help their research. We try to evaluate their innovation, okay, not just through the topic, okay, I'm making company, but also IP, market, regulatory, and so on. Okay, then we try to link them with the business professional there. Then we learn translation work parallel with research. Okay, even before the proof of concept, especially in the medical device domain. Okay. So I will just use Spark program to introduce what we are doing in NCKU to do the medical device translation. Again, we incubate more than 90 teams. And this is the 20, we have 22 star company and two ready to go. We finished four technology transfer. Okay, and now we have uh, 10 big projects after the training, got the training from the Spark program. Okay, and Spark program is actually initiated in Stanford by Doria and Kevin, but their focus is on the uh, pharmaceutical. Okay, but to Central University, because we don't have the resource and as well as we don't have the experience okay, in biotechnology. So we focus on medical device, translation in medical device, and also because we have a very good engineering, oncology as well as medicine, okay, so also a department of biomedical engineering, that we can bridge in these two domains together. And more importantly, we have a medical device industry cluster, okay, in the Southern Taiwan Science Park, and that's the reason why we chose medical device. Okay, so the fundamental end is try to do the tele incubation for translation. Okay, so although we are translating their research, but the more important thing is try to mindset, okay, how to do the translation. And ultimately, we hope to build an ecosystem to do this kind of translation there. So, because at the beginning, we don't know how to do the translation ourselves. So, we try to implement the Spark at NCQ as through the startup in the first phase, okay? So the team bring up their research and development technology and perhaps a topic. When we enhance their value, I ask them to go through the market, IP, regulatory, as well as the business model. We don't ask them to do the business plan, okay? Because the technology people, especially, I mean, just got the information, I just, uh, begin to touch this kind of, I mean, entrepreneur. If you ask them to write a business plan, most of the time, I mean, maybe 80 or even 90% is garbage. Okay, just a number, not really mean anything there. So we just ask them to find the right business model for their technology. So every team has to have the technology or market potential. They need to have a clinical staff in their team and they have to have a key person. That person should be the person to bring that technology, okay, to the market and perhaps the founder of the startup company. Okay, and one uh, major defect of most of the team is that they are all technical people. Okay, they know a lot of technology, but we will try to do the matchmaking with the business people, unfortunately fail a lot. Okay, we provide the project manager progress report. We have the training and you can see here, more than one third is business domain. We provide the guiding block, okay, and it's milestone payment. Okay, they have to give us, okay, their milestone within the next three months. Okay, then we discuss with the court. If we accept this I mean, milestone, then it's fine. After three months, we check on the milestone, then fine for the next phase. Okay, the lesson we learned here is we can provide anything but patient. Okay, the team, because they are so frustrated most of the time, so they need to have the patient to do it. Okay, and the most beautiful thing is the people. We have to fall in love with the value because we fail a lot. Okay, <laughs> the common value a mechanical need is not a true need. It's just a need for a single person or for a single MD. That's it. Okay, the team overemphasize our technical aspect. Even the business model is not well defined. And the poor quality of the IP protection and the team member is incomplete. Okay, so if you want to do the right or successful, you have to do everything not right, even to pick the right timing. Okay, in my point of view, the timing is just a luck. Okay, and you have to ask you everything. Okay, perfectly. So as I always know, translation is a milestone, not spring. And we try to build an ecosystem, we're still trying to build it. Okay, thank you. Okay.
dear uh, Professor Lodish, uh, Dr. Wu, Dr. Chang, and also my friend Dr. Lian here. Uh, it's uh, really my honor to present you uh, uh, my presentation here. Uh, I'm currently serving as the CEO of uh, Taipei Medical University Biomed Accelerator, and I have a little bit of training, innovation training from Stanford, Berkeley, and UCSF. Uh, and this is the quick facts about the Taipei Medical University, but uh, simply said, uh, we are one of the best uh, private universities in Taiwan. Yeah, so uh, if we talk about uh, Taiwan's unique advantage in biomedical innovation, we would say that Taiwan has, uh, has the tech excellence, right? We have a lot of uh, good tech companies, number three in ICT worldwide. We have a clinical excellence, which means we have a good healthcare system and good medical service. Judging by this, you might think that uh, Taiwan is uh, very well suited for development of uh, biomedical startups. But the fact is, uh, we are st still working hard in order to uh, develop uh, biomedical uh, innovation as an industry. Yeah. Why? So uh, I think uh, 10 years ago, uh, our uh, government established the Stanford Taiwan Biomedical Program, and it told us that if we need to start with the biomedical innovation, we must start with the unmet need. And uh, we at TMU uh, take a look at our ecosystem and see that the unmet need here at the Taiwanese biomedical ecosystem, including the first lack of investor, uh, especially in the early stage uh, of biomedical innovation. We lack uh, health tech focused uh, innovation hubs. And also, I think just as Dr. Lodish mentioned earlier, uh, it is very important to have uh, clinicians, scientists, and business person uh, working together. But uh, 10 years ago, we didn't have that. So uh, uh, looking at all of that, uh, we think we need to le learn from the world-leading ecosystem. And if we see from the number of biomedical startups, uh, we can see that uh, East Coast and West Coast of the United States and also in Europe are among the world's leading ecosystem. And uh, we take a look and we see that uh, one of the important things that this uh, ecosystem has but it does not is that uh, many of this ecosystem has uh, University cities working together with medical centers, and also uh, they have a good biomedical accelerators. So we did a visit to, uh, to the West Coast, uh, and uh, we see uh, that university-based uh, accelerators such as Berkeley Skydeck play an important role. We also did a visit to Boston, and we see uh, Martin Trust uh, Entrepreneurship Center. They run an accelerator program such as MIT Delta V. And uh, so uh, we concluded that uh, in order to build a university-based ecosystem, uh, we need to work with the translational methodology proven to work. At the time, we picked uh, two, two methodology. One is the biodesign methodology. The second is the discipline entrepreneurship methodology uh, based on the uh, MIT, uh, MIT uh, system. And then uh, we built a university-based accelerator uh, to serve as the core of our, uh, uh, our university-based uh, ecosystem. Yeah, uh, at the time, uh, our university is ex uh, is celebrating the 60th anniversary. So we decided to make a commitment to transform ourselves from a un research university to an innovative university. For that purpose, we established the accelerator and a biodesign center. Uh, then we host an international uh, BME conference, the BME IDEA. Uh, at, and lastly, uh, we built a biotech park uh, near our uh, Shanghao campus. So those are our steps in establishing our uh, ecosystem. And uh, behind the uh, ecosystem is uh, our uh, Office of Business Development, which serves as the ecosystem builder. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, we name our ecosystem the TMU Biodesign Ecosystem, which is starting from the hospital-based incubation, uh, followed by a university-based biomedical accelerator. Yeah, so uh, simply said, uh, our ideas would come from the Biodesign Center and our uh, interdisciplinary college, and then continue, we would incubate our ideas at a hospital-based innovation center. As uh, we know, uh, TMU uh, has three uh, affiliated hospital. Each hospital has its uh, innovation center. And then we continue to the TMU Spark uh, funding mechanism. Uh, lastly, we will accelerate the uh, companies at the accelerator. Yeah, so this is our uh, pathway. Yeah. So uh, a quick words about our biodesign center. So our biodesign center do we work with uh, Stanford Biodesign and uh, they teach us how to do clinical immersion. And currently uh, this is uh, our, our space. 
uh, which is uh, uh, used together to, with our uh, biomedical engineering department. Uh, and these are the faculties we send to the Stanford uh, to learn the biodesign methodology. And uh, then uh, I'll say a few quick words about our biomedical accelerator. So most of our uh, innovators come from academic background, and people from academic background usually have this uh, have this thinking that uh, building a company is a step by step process, and finally you will. Uh, successfully exit, but I think uh, Dr. Lodish here know better that uh, building a startup is often jump, jumping off the cliff, and whether you can land before your parachute opens or not, it is not sure. Yeah. So uh, in order to help the, our uh, our uh, professors and students with academic background going through the valley of death, uh, we uh, developed uh, we built the BTMU Biomed Accelerator to, to to help them. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, in the in the hindsight. Uh, Ten years ago, when we start building the accelerator, most accelerators are general accelerator. But over the last ten years, I think a lot of this uh, general accelerator has started the biotrics and even specialized biomedical accelerator has been established. So we believe we are on the right track to do this. Uh, all accelerators are able to uh, provide investment, mentoring, and market access. However, uh, as we position ourselves as a biomedical accelerator, we hope that we can uh, solve. Uh, solve some more problems in biomedical startups, such as a higher entry barrier, long uh, R&D time, regulatory and reimbursement hurdle, long sales cycle, and also complicated stakeholder relationships. Yeah. So uh, over the last three years, we did a try and error approach and uh, figure out the, the better methods to help the startups. So now uh, our process starts with the goal setting. We, we ask the startup whether you want to be, get invested, you want to do clinical trials, you want to uh, get adopted by DMU, and whether they want to uh, enter the global market. For people, uh, for teams who are uh, in urgent requirement to get investment, we will host an investment council for them. For those people uh, who wish to enter TMU, uh, we will host a TMU adoption committee. And for uh, those teams who wish to access global market, uh, we will host a global market access panel. And uh, we are uh, also recruiting our global market access partners. And uh, yeah, I, as you can see here, uh, some uh, partners in Japan and US here, we, we are already uh, engaging. Yeah. So uh, one good case study is a uh, long group, which is a rehabilitation device company. Uh, we help them doing a mentor consultation, stakeholders communication, clinical studies, and also product uh, promotion. Yeah. So uh, these are our six clinical facilities that help the teams doing clinical verification. Yeah, and over the years, we are uh, very lucky to have opportunities to work with uh, different partners, and we are especially uh, uh, lucky to be able to work with also with National Technology Research Park over the last few years. Yeah. And uh, I think um, a lot of international companies come to us because they want to do clinical studies in Taiwan, which is much more affordable than uh, US and Europe. We also have a good electronic clinical database, both intra hospital and both in the national health insurance system. Yeah. So we have good relationship with our Office of Human Research and also Data Science. Yeah, this is our ways of helping our startups. But uh, to be quick, yeah, uh, so this is our uh, Shanghe Park, which is uh, connected by a highway also to the National Biotechnology Re Research Park. This is our space, uh, a quick look. Now 40% of our startups come from international sources and we have partners all over Taiwan. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think this, uh, one important thing that we learned over the years is that startups need connection to the world in order to survive. And uh, we hosted this global market access panel. And in this opportunity, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Lodish, whether you could become a member of our uh, 6th July uh, global, global panel. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and these are a quick views of our startups, including some international startups and both uh, Taiwanese startups. So, uh, Lastly, because we are short on time, I will say, say about this. So what we learned from running a university-based accelerator in Taiwan. So we did, uh, over the last few years, we did uh, agree that Taiwan has a lot of unique advantages, talents, data, manufacturing capabilities, clinical trial site, and healthcare system. However, 
the startups need access to the global market in order to survive and grow. So I'll tell you a little bit of story. During the SARS year, uh, during the COVID years over the last two years, a lot of startups coming to us, uh, a lot of investors asking us, how come during that, those two years we have a lot of development? The official version I tell this start, uh, tell the investor is that, okay, our startups growing a lot because it is difficult to do clinical trials outside Taiwan. But the truth is that at that time, a lot of students and and professionals in Taiwan cannot go work abroad, so they are stuck. That's the reason uh, our startups have such much talents to help them. But in order to maintain that advantage, we need to access to the global market in order to uh, empowering our global uh, biomed talents. So one day we could uh, become a key strategic industry in Taiwan, such as a semiconductor industry and TSMC. Yeah, those are uh, my final words. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so, um, um, it, um, and uh, uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, good morning. My name is Oscar uh, Lee. Um, as some of you may know, I'm actually from National Yangming Chotong University, but I was on secondment. I'm actually on secondment to um, a medical university, a private one in central Taiwan, called China Medical University Hospital. Over there, I work as a vice uh, superintendent of the affiliated hospital. So. Today I'm going to, um, to uh, present some of the um, achievement of uh, CFUH in the past couple of years. So it's actually a big, um, big healthcare system with um, altogether 14 hospitals with uh, 5,000 plus beds um, in central Taiwan primarily. Um, so um, I think. Um, in order to give you a better flavor of uh, what CNUH has been doing, I use these uh, video clip to do some introduction. The advancements in digital technology and artificial intelligence have revolutionized healthcare at China Medical University Hospital, resulting in a comprehensive digital healthcare system. CNUH has been recognized as a top three global smart hospital by HIMSS. Our patient-centric and friendly approach is enhanced with AI technology, enabling us to provide the most comprehensive and accurate medical care. AI is revolutionizing healthcare and enabling innovative solutions, like CNUH's intelligent antimicrobial system. This system rapidly projects antibiotic resistance preventing sepsis and improving patient survival rates with accurate medication suggestions. The Mid-Taiwan Smart Heart Network employs an intelligent assistive system and utilizes remote AI interpretation to provide appropriate medical care for acute myocardial infarction before arrival at the hospital to save precious lives. In the post-COVID-19 era, so this daily clinic is in mountains central Taiwan.
AI accelerates the diagnostic process, enabling early intervention and improving the course of treatment, unlocking endless possibilities in healthcare. In digital healthcare, robots are revolutionizing surgery with precision, efficiency, and reliability. Mechanized arms and image-guided procedures minimize risks and accelerate so recovery time. Post-operative cleaning and disinfection robots reduce the risk of cross-infection, maintaining a hygienic environment. Robots have transformed medical practices and created a high-quality and efficient healthcare system. At CMUH, we strive for excellence by building a smart and connected healthcare system that enhances the relationship between patients and medical staff, leading to a better quality of life. So um, my job um, at CMUH is to facilitate the digital transformation of the hospital. Therefore, a lot of innovations are on um, smart healthcare. Um, so to me, uh, while well, I was on board first of August uh, 2020, that was in the middle of a COVID pandemic, that certainly has rapidly accelerated the digital transformation of healthcare delivery. So our strategy is to use establish platforms, namely three platforms. So we have a big data cloud platforms. We work with uh, Microsoft Azure. We have a very good cloud infrastructure so that we can have all uh, big data center. And we uh, have, we also have established an AI center where we have recruited over 70 data scientists. And more importantly, um, we um, try to visualize the fragmented medical information using Power BI approach. So with these um, um, three platforms, platform-based strategy, we can do um, a lot of uh, in innovation and invent new te technologies. And to me, um, uh, this hospital has been always been on the track of uh, getting external validation. So like I mentioned, I was on board in 2020, but before I was on board, they already have uh, passed three times of a joint commission and national accreditation. And in 2019, they have this HIMSS MRN7 validation. This year, we're going to revalidate our MRN7, and we're also going to do infram and a few other modules um, offered by these HIMSS, which stands for um, Healthcare Information Management System Society. Uh, Chicago-based international non-profit organization. And we also have done a lot of um, um, ISO uh, validation qualification to make sure that we protect patient information properly. So this is the second strategy. So external validation to us is important. So last year, um, we did. Um, we um, uh, actively uh, sort of participated in this uh, digital health indicator um, validation by HIMSS. So these are the four domains in each time. I'm not going to go through that, but the result came out well. We actually ranked global number three, no kidding, in 2022. So the third strategy is we always wanted to go global, connect with the rest of the world, so um, we, um, for example, we um, work heavily on our artificial intelligence. So we uh, collaborated with the National Institute of Health. And actually, uh, about two months ago, we had an AI seminar series, uh, NIH AI Medical Seminar Series. It's actually the first of this series, the second one in Mayo Clinic, that work with the NIH. So we, are, we think that we have reached certain levels so that um, NIH it was willing to uh, work together with us. As you all know, that's not something money can buy, right? You gotta reach that standard so that you can work with the NIH. And actually, um, the um, video recording was there online for those of you who are interested. Uh, feel free to um, have a click and have a look. Now, I don't have time to go through the, um, the sort of structures and details of how innovation was nurtured. You say, I'm going to 
share the result or strategy. So um, quite some of the previous uh, speakers mentioned Stanford, but I don't know whether uh, you know who Fred Terman is. Fred Terman was the dean of engineering school who gave $500 to um, Bill Hewitt and David Becker to establish HP in the year 1939. And what was the return? So in the year 89, uh, no, 1986, well, HP became very successful. David Pepper went back to the university to donate what Stanford Children's Hospital, $40 million donation. So the return was, uh, how much, how much, what's the multiple you divide that? Four, four, 40,000, 50, and, and then divide by $500. So this is what we're doing. So we are choosing the most potential companies, and then we help them financially. We fill these companies, so to speak. And the, the, and in, the, in my, I was there since uh, August 2020. So, for, uh, so 2021, so Ever Supreme was become public traded. 20, 2022, Ever Fortune and Shyam, which is on, um, which is on um, emerging market. So this is what they're doing. Every Supreme is doing DCCIK, DC, and this bone marrow stem cell treatment for the osteoarthritis region. It's actually me who injected patients' knees. So we've already done 70 cases. Um, and, and on the pipeline, Every Supreme is also working on CAR T. So we have allogeneic CAR T targeting um, HLA gene as a specific, as a unique. Um, uh, target, and then we have these uh, new um, way of making um, CAR T. We use this nanobar, nanobody um, to make CAR T cells. So for Shyam, Shyam is doing novel, developing novel therapeutics for cancer. So Shyam is doing uh, uh, these uh, novel uh, exosomes uh, with a with a target to uh, deliver doxorubicin and to deliver microRNA to treat cancer. Um, also, um, sorry. So these are these are just uh, some of the examples of our strategy. We do it top down. Which uh, which is my job right, as a vice superintendent over uh, for in charge of the overall R&D activities of the hospital. So I report to my superintendent, my boss, and then the boss reported to the board about the most pro promising, most fundable startups from the hospital. So this is our way of uh, making success. And both companies, which are public listed, have a good stock price. It's not, it's not kind of like one shopping. And actually, the um, financial statements of um, the companies actually work well. They are profit-making companies, like uh, Professor Lodish mentioned. From ever, ever since from day one, the purpose of startup is not to form a company. <laughs> it's not for public listing. It's for profit. And we always follow that logic very simply. And that basically um, help us develop in our hospital. So for this Newsweek um, uh, ranking, we rank number five in Taiwan. It's just a private um, medical university hospital, which is not in Taipei. Um, so I think uh, we're doing OK, but we're not satisfied. We're trying to move um, forward further. Finally, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. I, I, I won't invite everybody to uh, just take the time, because we are. Uh, so I'm going to invite Dr. Rodish to give us some comment just here. We don't need to move. Okay. And we can continue our conversation during lunch. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> you're putting me on the spot, but yes. that is all. Sorry about, about that. Um, just a general comment about startups. Our experience with the mass life science is informative because 
each cycle we would get perhaps 30 applications for funding. And we would review them, as I mentioned, both by an academic scientist and by an investor. Out of the 30, we would wind up funding only four or five. And the point is, a number of biotech companies either shouldn't have gotten stuck or are going to encounter major problems. And this is one of the reasons academic scientists need to be freed up so that they can consult and work with these companies. Because very often the idea that you start a company with needs to be changed. It needs to be expanded in some cases, seriously, that as the company moves forward, there are advances in related fields that say you really need to switch technology. Just a simple example that you're familiar with, Moderna, founded as a gene therapy company. The whole idea was to use messenger RNAs encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles as gene therapy vehicles. And that was based on earlier work from Children's Hospital that by modifying the bases in the intranucleotide connection, you could generate messenger RNAs that function for long periods of time. It made a lot of sense, and except it never worked. And the company then pivoted to become a vaccine company, particularly during the early stages of the Ebola epidemic. And of course, once COVID came along, they were primed to immediately jump in and become a COVID vaccine company. But the point I'm making is that the reason they set up the company was not the reason they succeeded. You see. And that's true for a lot of companies. So the piece that I didn't hear is, for any of these presentations, is one, the making faculty available as consultants and board members. I think it's important to have a scientist on the board of the company. Uh, he, she can explain to the other people in, in non-scientific terms what the progress is and what it means. And then for each of the companies to have its own scientific advisory board. I didn't hear that word once in these presentations. That scientists both from academics and from other companies, to serve on a board who will regularly meet and help the company build its progress. Because there is actually a long way between taking something out of your university and getting it into clinical practice. That can be years you may have an idea of a monoclonal antibody or a small molecule drug, but to develop that and to improve it and to optimize it can take several years, many millions of dollars, and you'll need that to really develop a viable therapeutic. So there are pieces, I, I was very impressed by what I saw but I also saw pieces that were missing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At this uh, stage, I still would like to invite everybody for a photo opportunity. I love these chairs so much. <laughs> I cannot resist not to sit uh, on that. And while everybody is moving, I just want to repeat uh, uh, Professor Logie's uh, take-home message. The take-home message is in your slide that MIT, only, uh, MIT pay you 
five days a week, and you only need to teach four days. And the other day, you can solve for companies. I think we have, a, in our system, we can also do that, right? No, you can't. Okay, 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 okay. So this is... <laughs> I'm going to meet with the Prime Minister. <laughs> See? And that will be my major message. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, so one day, and, and one day, uh, according to what you just said, that one day is best served if these professors can sit on the board or the scientific advisory board of the company to help them grow. No, absolutely. And, you know, I also am on several boards of nonprofits. Oh, okay. See, it's not all making money. You know, I serve without pay on the boards of Children's Hospital. And I serve on the board of a mental health institution. So I, I, I just feel I have to tell you that not everything I do is involved in making money. And also, when I serve on these boards, I don't get paid. I do it for shares in the company. And I feel that's important because the only reward I get is if the company is successful. I think this is, uh, today we, we do not have National Taiwan University hospitals. Uh, which are Alan, Dr. Lien, just shared with us a story of their licensing and technology to a U.S. company. But uh, it's a story uh, told by Alan that uh, NTU or the inventor of the technology did not get the financial benefit uh, from that uh, a little bit. But so, so this this lesson, I think, uh, I think we are taking this lesson seriously. So, a couple of points, uh, if I may. Uh, one one thing is that the liver part, the clinical part, is expensive, expensive and difficult. And as you said, that when you founded the company. The company which, which succeed may not be the product which they envision in the beginning. So there are lots of knowledge and, and know-how trying to steer the company towards success. So these are the valuable uh, steps. I think uh, you guys here, are, we are doing quite well in helping uh, your students or your Step to start up, but that's the only necessary first step in order to them to capture the eventual big value that takes much more than that. I agree. <laughs> so, so, anybody of you, do you? Are, I, I don't think we have much time, but do you have any question? Uh, like, uh, so I'm, I'm very concerned about our uh, startups' eventual success in the global markets because, like, uh, Taiwan have a very limited uh, clinical market for uh, biomedical products. So uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Lodish, uh, how, how do you think uh, Taiwan's uh, startups could uh, succeed in, uh, in international markets? Simply put, by developing treatments for diseases that are worldwide. And also by focusing on rare diseases in the Asian Because there are relatively few institutions, universities, that focus on rare diseases. You've got an awful lot of neighbors that don't have the high quality medical care that you guys have, that are tradi more traditional cultures that will have their own indigenous rare diseases, I think you can do a lot helping them as well. All right. 
who just uh, discussed with me uh, down, down there. Uh, I believe that uh, one of the slides, one of your slides highlighting everybody's working together. I love that slide. Uh, you, 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 you presented that uh, they were competing with each other until they are working. And it still continues. Uh, we're building the Riga Institute, which is a billion dollar gift of this philanthropist, Larry Riga. It deals with infectious and immune diseases. It's a partnership of MIT, Harvard, Massachusetts General Hospital, and I'm not sure what else. And this is what you want. It happens to be on the MIT campus. But if I look at the Broad Institute, it's got workers from every place in Boston. And, and that's what makes it work great. Right. Uh, yes, that's the point uh, I want to respond to, 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 to Dr. 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 So this, uh, perhaps uh, later, if you have time, uh, we can, we can you know, drive you around to see. Taipei is a very small city, and we are taking a tunnel, you know, from here to, uh, to the, uh, the, the high-speed rail station. And uh, Taipei Medical University is not very far away. Actually, uh, I think so. it's, it's only perhaps uh, three miles away from, from here. It's not walking distance, but through MRT and everything. But I believe Academia Seneca could be the leader to, because you already built this uh, state of art. You know, our current standard the status is much, much better when Dr. Lodish, you know, start up Genza. You had nothing right. except your passion. Somebody said passion. And our... And your brain. <laughs> and you started, uh, you know, you know, top tier companies, which then, after 20, 30 years, value billions of dollars. I think we, we have a long way to be there, but I think we share this common passion. I mean, look, I will go so far as to argue, just to be argumentative, build a large incubator at academic center, and have all the other universities send their companies to one incubator. So just think about that. Just think idea. about that idea. Just think about it. And see if in this context it makes sense. Okay. Okay. With this, I thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Remain on the seats, and now uh, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Wu to give us a, a short closing remark before the group photo. Okay, so uh, today's conference uh, has come to the conclusion. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Lovich and uh, all our distinguished speaker. Uh, is, uh, they is a give us, uh, share us the, uh, invaluable uh, insight and experience, uh, uh, translation and the commercialization. And he also have uh, also shared with us uh, from the innovative research to the uh, uh, medical product. So I think uh, all of this can benefit, uh, clinical benefit to the patient and the human health. So uh, uh, I, I, I really appreciate all our distinguished speaker. And I also look forward, uh, look forward, we have uh, more collaboration and uh, communication in the near future. So uh, thank you all for coming. See you uh, next time. Bye-bye.